I'd like you all to close your eyes for a second. Think of a witch. What image do you have? Perhaps an old woman, slightly irritable, warty, someone that isn't popular in a village. But I can guarantee that for most of you, you'll have pictured a woman. So what if I tell you that most witches weren't necessarily old? Of course, we don't know from the historical record whether they were warty or not, and we don't necessarily know their ages. Many of them were young. Many of them were teenagers. Many of them, sadly, were children. But what I'd like to tell you also is that between 20 and 25% of those persecuted for witchcraft in the early modern period, they were actually men. So if we can debunk one of our most commonly held stereotypes, that of the witch, what else are we making assumptions about? Social mobility, is it a dance with the devil? I grew up in the Northwest, in a town called Chester. I grew up in a working class household, brought up by my mother and my grandmother. My grandfather came from Poland during the war, and he was one of that brave generation that flew raids, dropping food parcels over Poland in its hour of need, for which he received the highest commendations and medals. My father came over in the 60s and worked in the NHS. In my 12th year, something, two things happened in my life that would change my life forever. One was that I was very lucky and got a scholarship to an independent girls' school. The other was that my grandmother fell down the stairs and she was paraplegic. She was paralyzed from the neck down. My mother, already a single parent, made the courageous decision to bring her home and for us to look after her. And so I became a young carer. And I spent my teenage years with all the constraints and restraints that looking after someone else brings. So if we look at the statistics, I have managed to, through social mobility, go from being a young carer to CEO of a national charity that works on social and economic inequality. Surely that's social mobility in action. So the myth is, as one ex-Prime Minister said, that we're all middle class now. We should all go to university. But what does that tell us about how working class people and working class culture is perceived? Because the narrative of social mobility says that we should pluck the bright but poor kids out of the working class, out of their situations, and we should move them up into the middle class, give them a good education. But that is a few people. And that means we leave the rest behind. We see many portrayals of working class life, working class culture, working class people, and it's generally the, the fact that they are demonized through the media, on the stage, and in the screen. And that the manual is seen as something primitive or naive. The skills that our mothers and grandmothers had, they knitted, they weaved, they span, were essential for them and for their household economies. But now they've become the middle class leisure pursuits. Those apprentices in the early modern period who went on to become master weavers, master goldsmiths, master masons, would look at the apprentices we have these days and they would pity them for the lack of respect, the lack of status, and often the lack of training and the lack of job that is associated with apprenticeships. So even when we make it, we're still very often within those constraints of class or race. It's perfectly fine for me to be the director of an equality charity, but would it be equally fine? Would my face also fit if I were to become, say, a historical novelist? 
or even, let's say, the principal of an Oxford college. Working class author Kit DeWall wrote a while ago about the fact that as a working class author, we very often, she was very often moderated by middle class editors seeking to moderate the work for a middle class audience. And recently, the working class actor Christopher Eccleston has said he is always offered the roles of working class characters. He wants to play kings, he wants to play emperors, and why not? And even recently in the BBC, we've had Steph McGovern saying that she thinks she's paid less because she's not as posh as some of her counterparts. So there are many inequalities inherent in a narrative of social mobility. And as another ex-Prime Minister has said, it's all about education, education, education. Surely this is the silver bullet in terms of social mobility. After all, it worked for me. But is our education system contributing to entrenching income inequality in our society? When we look at nursery and primary school, we see the barriers starting to open up already. Many children, of course, don't have access to good quality nursery provision. And we know that for some children from disadvantaged backgrounds, they are already 18 months behind their more advantaged peers by the time they start primary school. This is four and five-year-olds. We have grammars and independent schools that are contributing to this gap. And in a great debate about grammar schools, the research tells us that in areas where there are grammar schools, those who are not selected, those who don't go to grammar schools, actually end up earning less than in areas where there are not grammar schools. Russell Group Universities, another sift, further exacerbating this gap. And all of this culminates in the hierarchy that we know we have in our society. It's no coincidence that around 70% of judges went to fee-paying schools, that over 50% print journalists went to fee-paying schools. And the influence that people wield is really important. Because when we look at the policy makers, when we look at the people who are in a position to make those changes for our society, we very often find that they have no experience at all, no lived experience of the policy areas that they're talking about. But many people will say it's all about meritocracy. You know, the cream will rise to the top. And yet, let me put it this way. Those who have privilege are in the Olympic Stadium. They're running a relay, passing on the intergenerational baton of privilege and of wealth and of position. Whilst the rest of us face so many barriers to even getting inside that stadium. There is no level playing field. Now, this matters because inequality matters. And we know from the work from 2009 of Wilkinson and Pickett and a plethora of research that's come out since then, that in countries with high levels of inequality, you also have high levels of socially determined ills. Higher levels of physical and mental ill health higher levels of obesity, teenage pregnancies, and infant mortality. We have one of the highest rates of infant mortality in Europe, and it's directly linked to socioeconomic status. If you're poorer, you're more likely to lose your child as an infant. We have lower levels of trust. We have lower levels of social mobility. And we also have lower levels of educational attainment. Now, this matters also because of health inequalities that are inherent when we have a huge gap in terms of income in society. And the Longevity Science Panel found that income was one of the key factors in terms of life expectancy. 
A boy born today in the most disadvantaged 20% of neighbourhoods will lose 8.4 years of life. He will not live 8.4 years as long as his contemporary who is born in the 20% of the most affluent areas. Inequality is costing lives. So what price social mobility? Can we really afford to keep plucking some deserving poor but bright children and leaving the rest behind when we know what we know about inequality? And I'd also like to look at the personal aspects of social mobility. We're talking about mental health today and the effect on one's mental health of being plucked out of potentially your family, your society, your community, and having to wear that mask and having to wonder if you belong. When I sat down on the first day at my public school and we were ranked in alphabetical order, I sat next to a girl who said, hello, my name's Hobby and I've got a pony called Monty. <laughs> and I thought, I live in a terraced house with an outside toilet. That was the truth of it. The anxiety we feel when we're in situations and societies where we are different, where we know we are different, it can make or break us. And what I think is that policy often to get people to university, to other, into other areas as well, that the policy makers forget that reality begins where the policy ends. Yes, it's great. We can get people into university, but actually then what happens when they're there? There's a far higher dropout rate of disadvantaged students from university. And how does that scar them? How does that make them feel for the rest of their lives? We know that people who've taken a grammar school exam and failed are still talking about it 20, 30 years later because they feel it was such a painful experience. So we also have to think about the personal aspects of this. And when we talk about social mobility, I have yet really to hear anyone in public discourse talk about downward social mobility. And as we know from the adverts on the television, your investment may go up or it may go down. So to see that downward social mobility actually accounts for 28.6% means we should really be thinking about the social mobility narrative. The reason I'm talking about social mobility and inequality today is because I feel as someone who's had the benefits of social mobility, I feel very passionate about making sure that we don't see it as the cure. Because it's a red herring and it's a distraction from the real prize. And the real prize is that we have a good education system for all of our children. An education system that doesn't have overworked, overstretched teachers trying to teach to a test when they actually want to spend more time on pastoral care with their children. An education system that isn't starved of funds, that allows poor children to also explore the arts, to discover if they're good at music, to discover if they're great at drama, to have all of those opportunities. What if the purpose of education was for every child to find their potential and to find their passion? We need to make sure that we have good jobs, healthy lives, good well-being, and that is for everybody. So let's not pretend that social mobility can do the job of reducing inequality. Because we need the tide to turn for the many, not just for the lucky few to ride on the crest of the wave. Thank you. <laughs>